We are so glad you're here with the Center on Faith and Justice. Jim Wallace is my name, I'm the director of the center, and the uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, chair of Faith and Justice here at Georgetown. Um, we have a book to talk about tonight. It looks good, it, it reads good, but it looks good too. The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future by Robert P. Jones, as we know him, Robbie Jones. Uh, our conversation tonight is about white supremacy going way back to 1493, but also uh, right now, and how Robbie's traveled around the country and found really some, some glimmers of hope in repair efforts happening around the country. I wanna say, Robbie, I believe this book is an essential read for the reimagining of America's future. So I'm very grateful for the book and to you for writing it. Oh, thank you. Let's give him a hand to start with. Huh? <laughs> Always clap for an author at the beginning of a book tour, which we're blessed to do t tonight. So uh, a programming note, where there's books out there, uh, uh, and Robbie will be available to sign some copies afterwards. Uh, there'll be, and then there is a reception. I peeked in and looking like some good stuff out there, so <laughs> please stay for that. Let me introduce our, our panel. Uh, we're colleagues, it was, but as we said before, we're also friends of Robbie. So we're, this is a conversation. It isn't just lectures and presentations, but a conversation about this important question of not just where we've been, but where we are going from here. So. Robert P. Jones is the president and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute, PRRI. He's writing, his writings on religion, culture, and politics have appeared in the New York Times, the Atlantic, Time Magazine, Religion News Service, and I'll say lots of other places. Uh, he's the author, also the author of White Too Long, which is out there, and The End of White Christian America. That's a thought, The End of White Christian America. That's out there too. Van R. Newkirk II, he's a junior like I am, the second, there you go, <laughs> is a senior editor at The Atlantic and a host and co-creator of narrative podcasts, Floodlines and Holy Week. Uh, for years, Newkirk has covered voting rights, democracy, and environmental justice with a focus on how race and class shape this country's and the world's fundamental structures. He does wonderful structural analysis. Jennifer Rubin, who we all love to read, I, I said to her, she said, not everybody loves to read me, but I do, <laughs> writes reported opinion and columns for the Washington Post. She covers politics and policy, foreign and domestic. She provides insight into the conservative movement, the Republican and Democratic parties, and threats to Western democracies. So thank you all for joining us tonight. We've got a great group. So Robbie, let me start with you. You've written two excellent and comprehensive books on white racism and white Christians. Uh, somebody asked me this morning about uh, all the white guys who write books so much on racism. I said, well, we have telephone booth conferences. But uh, uh, White Too Long and the Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity and the End of White Christian America what made you think you wanted to write, some would say, a third book around this topic of white supremacy and white Christians? And what part of the story did you feel like you still wanted to tell? Well, thanks, Jim. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming um, uh, here in Georgetown. Um, uh, and thank uh, both to Van and to Jennifer and to, and to Jim. Um, I'm admirers of all of their work, um, which is why I asked them to come and have this conversation. Uh, with me uh, tonight, so I can't think of a better. This is the official like launch event yeah. uh, uh, for the book. Uh, it was just out yesterday, uh, so this is the first public event uh, today. I'm very like honored to have all of you here. So thank you uh, for being here with me. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, right. So I wish I could say that you know I looked across the vast, uh, you know, next 10 years of my career and said, I'm going to write these three books and it's going to be this trilogy. And, you know, 
uh, but it was absolutely not the case at all. I, I, I've always been just trying to write the next book in front of me. Um, but one, in retrospect, um, I think I can see a through line, um, even if I didn't have one you know, going in. So The End of White Christian America, which came out in 2016, was really a, a demographic book. Um, so I'm trained in sociology of religion, so I kind of used those skills to really think about the changing uh, context of the country and, and why the country seemed, the, the divides uh, between it seemed to be along lines of race and religion, what was going on. And, and there, I think the key insight was um, that during um, the tenure of our first African-American president, Barack Obama, we had also passed this uh, major milestone in terms of demographics, and that is we had moved from being uh, a majority white Christian country at the beginning of his election uh, as president, and by the end of his second term, we were no longer uh, a country that was majority white and Christian. Uh, so just to give you the numbers, it went from 54% white and Christian in uh, 2008. By the time he comes out of office, it's 47%, and now that number is 42% uh, percent in the country. So we continue to see this decline, and that shift I think, uh, particularly for uh, conservative white Christians who had, uh, I think, been accustomed to seeing themselves at the center of American history and at, and at the top of the power pyramid, right, of politics and culture, uh, suddenly finding themselves more on the margins. I think as part of, uh, I, you know, what I sometimes tongue-in-cheek call the great white Christian freakout uh, moment, I think, that we've been experiencing, and that with the symbolic present of our first African-American president at the same time. It was like no mistaking, right, that things were shifting um, in, in the country. Um, and then the, the second book, um, uh, White Too Long, uh, that came out in 2020, um, I realized that, okay, that's the demographics, uh, but I've got to like locate this in my own story um, in some ways. So uh, that book was really um, probably a third memoir, uh, really trying to trace so how does this entanglement of white supremacy and Christianity show up uh, in my own family's history, my own faith uh, journey? So I grew up uh, Southern Baptist in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, so the deep south in this white evangelical uh, world. And I have my extended family goes back um, five generations in middle Georgia, right? Uh, and Baptists, all the way, a few Methodists thrown in for good measure, but, but mostly Baptists all the way back uh, to the early 1800s. In fact, I have a family Bible uh, from 1815, uh, from my mother's side of the family, uh, right? This kind of treasured thing passed along. But as I began doing research, I also found that that same family that valued this Bible and passed it along uh, had enslaved people, right? And found an estate settlement from the, actually the same family name that is in the Bible uh, with four enslaved people with by name and the, uh, a woman named Naomi at $400, Bird, a boy, at $150, Right? And that reality of those things holding together, right? the people that were professing Christianity, handing down and, and guarding this, this family heirloom, uh, that these things sat comfortably together. And so that book was tracing that really into the 19th century and, and with my family story. And I realized that um, what was missing from that story is where did my family get the land uh, that they got in 1815 when they arrived from Virginia to Georgia? And the answer to that, of course, is from indigenous people. Right, uh, and what's going on in 1815? Well, it's Georgia forcing off the Cherokee um, out of Georgia, uh, uh, breaking treaties uh, with the, with the U.S. government, uh, forcibly removing uh, people on what we now know as the Trail of Tears, right, over to what is now um, Oklahoma. So my European ancestry uh, forebears uh, got free 200 acre little rectangles of land in land lotteries uh, after the uh, Cherokee had been forcibly removed. And that part of the story I knew almost nothing about. Um, so in many ways, this book, I think, is pulling that thread and just tracing it back to its roots. Um, and I, I get it. Um, I really uh, land the story, I think, on that part in this book, um, pulling it back from the 19th century uh, back to 1493. Um, I could talk more about that later, about yeah, what will, that, yeah. that significance of that date is. So who's at the center and the top undergirded by family Bible? Um, Robbie, your book centers on the legal concept that dates back to the 15th century called the doctrine of discovery. Remember that. The doctrine, it's not taught in most of our schools. The doctrine of discovery. And you write in a key quote from your book, I'll just read this. The spirit of the doctrine of discovery continues to haunt us today. We remain torn by two mutually 
incompatible visions of the country. Are we a pluralistic democracy where all, regardless of race or religion, are equal citizens? Or are we a divinely ordained promised land for European Christians? The confounding paradoxes, constant confusions, and violent convulsions of the present are signs, and here's the key, that we've yet to choose between these two streams of history. So what is the doctrine of discovery? And why is it so important in understanding what's going on in our country and world right now, today? Well, I should say that, um, you know, I've got a PhD in religion, uh, and I really got taught very little about yeah. the, the doctrine of discovery, right? Throughout my higher education, through graduate school, seminary. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I'd heard the term, but it certainly was never taught as something central, I think, to um, you know, America's current identity crisis, which is the way I think about it uh, now. And in many ways, a, a kind of Rosetta Stone for kind of understanding the, the deep structure of the conflicts that we're experiencing today. But essentially, it's a set of uh, Christian doctrines that were put forward uh, in the late 15th century over a period of about 50 years um, uh, that were all about this dilemma. So what happens in the late 15th century? Well, it's the first European contact with the Americas, right? And so there are these quote-unquote discovered lands with, quote-unquote, discovered people um, in them. And there is this dilemma. What do we do? What's our responsibility? Uh, 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 and, and can we exploit <laughs> these lands and, and these people? And so uh, 1493 is, is the year that I think is significant for the Americas uh, and for our, our country because it's, it's not the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right, 1492. Uh, it's the next year when he goes back. And so what he goes back to do is to get more soldiers, more missionaries, Right and more supplies to come back and uh, really conquer and colonize. Right, that's really the mission, and he needs permission to do that. So who does he appeal to? He appeals to uh, the political structures, Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain, but he also appeals to uh, the closest thing to international law that actually existed in Europe at the time, and that is the Pope in Rome. Um, mm -hmm. And I should say, like uh, we're at a Catholic university, um, this is not just a Catholic issue. Right. Uh, so these edicts, they were papal bulls, which means they were kind of official edicts from the Vatican. Uh, but this is before the Protestant Catholic split. This is before the split between the Church of England uh, and Catholicism. So all of Western Europe, right, is under the jurisdiction of, uh, of the, the, pap the uh, papal powers in, in Rome. And th these documents just spell it out very straightforwardly. And what they say is this. The, the key part of the logic is... Uh, that who deserves human rights and who does not uh, is predicated on one thing only, and that is, are they Christian, right? And the, the logic of this is, if these lands are occupied by people who are not Christian, and if they are not, the other, and the only other corollary or caveat is, and they are not already dominated by a Christian power, right? Uh, so you can't interfere in another Christian power, uh, but if they are, if they are free, uh, free of Christian domination already and not Christian, you have the blessing of the church and the state uh, to go in to conquer, to kill, to steal their goods, uh, occupy their towns, claim the land. Uh, uh, and then this, this line, which I just seared in my mind, it's in the document. Uh, there's a great, by the way, quick aside, there's a great website called the thedoctrineofdiscovery.org uh, where all these documents are there. They're in Latin, they're in English. You can kind of see them in the original. Um, and, you know, it, and it says... Um, you have, and this is, again, from the, the head, you know, the person that uh, Christians thought of as the vicar of Christ on earth, right, says this, uh, that you have the right not only to go in and kill, conquer, and all that, but to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, right? Mm -hmm. That's in the document, mm -hmm. right, in addition to all of the other rights. So mm -hmm. that sense, right, of these lands, these previously undiscovered lands by Europeans, being set up and understood to be claimed um, as a kind of promised land. Uh, for European Christians, regardless of the people um, who are already here, is kind of the key insight and, and really the power uh, of the doctrine of discovery that sets off uh, uh, Native American genocide, it sets off the transatlantic trade, uh, slave trade, all of it, right? Uh, you can trace back to the root of this, this idea. The fact that it isn't just Catholic, look at Cotton Mather, leading Puritan preacher when he came, he said all the same things. So, Van, you've written deeply about the structural ways that racism persists in this country. 
In the article in the Atlantic, you write about how thousands of black farmers in Mississippi had their land taken from them and how this is a pattern in American history. You write, the land in the Mississippi Delta was first wrestled from Native Americans by force, it was then cleared, watered, made productive for intensive agriculture by the labor of enslaved Africans, who after emancipation would come to own a portion of it. Later though, through a variety of means, legal, coercive, legal and coercive, and occasionally violent, farmland owned by black people came into the hands of white people. So I want to ask you, how do you see the themes in Robbie's book? You've got all kinds of purple <laughs> things here. So I know you've read the book. Uh, how do you put them in there randomly. You just put them in there. <laughs> it's a good performance. Uh, how do these themes in Robbie's book address that kind of reporting that you've done? So actually, I met Robbie at, because of that article. Uh, Robbie is a, a good Mississippi boy. Um, and uh, my folks are from Mississippi, and I wrote that article uh, sort of as part of me trying to trace my mother's uh, familial history. And she was born in a shotgun house, the uh, daughter and granddaughter of sharecroppers in Mississippi. Uh, and so I wrote that piece basically based on uh, the family stories that I had of, of people who had had their land, uh, well, land that by title or by custom had belonged to them, uh, and they had it taken from them uh, in a number of ways. So in the book, um, again, which is a, a great book, uh, you talk about this process by which the Mississippi Delta, especially uh, under uh, its new dominion uh, from uh, settlers was made into farmland. It wasn't farmland originally, it was, uh, you, it was hunting land. It was a vast forest and swamp. And it was a massive effort at completely transforming the entire state of Mississippi, really, into a, what is still now one of the most productive agricultural uh, domains in the world. And so I think I'm trying to, in that story, and you do this work in the book as well, trace what is, how do we work backwards from the present? Uh, how do we work backwards from a system now where that same agricultural farmland now mm -hmm. in the hands of corporations for the most part, uh, which now produces so much of our soybean exports overseas. How do we work backwards uh, to talk about who actually owns that, who is responsible for that, mm -hmm. and how do we make those layers of injustice right? It's a very difficult question. So these aren't just historical matters. For you, in your case, they were family matters. Right. So this is all personal. It touches on people's personal lives and it's transformational. So Jennifer, you've covered the MAGA movement extensively, including how it has morphed into an ethno-religious movement during the Trump years. In what ways is the MAGA movement different from other political conservative movements that you've seen in your in covering of politics? And how does Robbie's work in this latest book contribute to your understanding of, I would say, both MAGA Republicans and white evangelicals. Well, thank you for having us. Um, when I first read Robbie's first book, the light bulbs went off mm. in my brain because I had been wrestling with this question, what are they so angry about? Huh. That the Trump supporters who are if you overlay them with white evangelicals, you remember your Venn diagrams, it's a, a very close match. So why are they so angry? Um, what, are, what has America done to them? What has happened in their lives that they appear so embittered, so resentful, um, and so determined to, as they say, make America great again? Right. And the again is the critical aspect of that mm -hmm. because it is harkening back right. 
to this hierarchical structure that Robbie and Anne have written about. So what is it? What has freaked them out so? And I think Robbie came up with the answer. When you've gotten used to being the one with all the marbles, right. if anyone comes along to take even one, that's your loss. They're taking something away from me. And that sense of loss, first of all, of entitlement that is theirs to begin with, and secondly, of loss, permeates this entire political movement. It permeates their sense that America is changing, that they don't recognize America. It comes out in small, seemingly trivial ways. They don't say Merry Christmas, they say Happy Holidays. Who cares? They care because they think of themselves as the dominant religious and the dominant racial group in America. And once that came to light and that light bulb went on, it was much easier to understand their political tenor, which is angry, resentful, and also the things they want to do. Why do they want to suppress the votes of African Americans and to a large extent Hispanics? Because they are the real Americans. The democracy is only legitimate if they hold power. Right. Therefore, if they can't command electoral majorities, they're going to have to excise the electorate. And so in many ways, on many mm -hmm. different levels, it explained a lot of the current political <coughs> era that we are in. But going back to something um, that you said earlier is this issue of responsibility. I'm a Jewish American. My parents came from Europe, um, or my parents' parents came from Europe in the early 20th century. So I've gone through life thinking, oh, none of this was my fault. I didn't benefit from any of this. And as you pull the strands apart, mm -hmm. you realize that all of us have benefited from this exploitation. Where did the largesse come from the Osage Indians whose oil monies were stolen? It went back to the federal government mm -hmm. who built stuff, who created stuff that we all benefited from. So once you begin to peel back, as you say, to go back to the origins, it's not a question of guilt, and this is the complaint that we always hear. You're trying to make us feel bad. You're trying to make us feel guilty. Um, well, first of all, as a Jewish American, I can say there's nothing wrong with guilt. It will keep you in very good stead for very many years. Guilt is good. Um, but it is also a recognition. It's forcing them to recognize they just didn't get there simply on the merit of their own excellence. They had a big head start. And how we wrestle with the ways in which wealth and power were accumulated and how we move towards a more just, more fair mm -hmm. society that is closer to that ideal right. that Robbie spoke about, a multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracy, is really the central story of America. Right. What you are dealing with is the central dilemma that we have had generation after generation, whether it was the antebellum period, whether it was the Civil War, whether it was Reconstruction, the early 20th century. This has been the dilemma because we really have never been willing to come to terms with this. And that's why the history battle is so important to the Magorite. If they control history, they control this narrative. Mm -hmm. They maintain their moral innocence. They maintain their entitlement. And nothing has to change. They're not responsible for anything. They're not responsible for mass incarceration. They're not responsible for redlining, which created a huge imbalance in wealth. They're not responsible for it at all. And they can continue on their way. And that's a powerful emotion, which is why they're so defensive about it. Lest anyone hear about the Tulsa race massacre, mm -hmm. they might think, hey, what happened to all that wealth that was accumulated yeah. on Black Wall Street? Who got that? Right. And how do you return that? Or how do you 
make a just resolution of that. So needless to say, Robbie has had a big influence on my thinking and my writing. Um, and he asks very profound, very troubling questions. So responsibility calls for honesty. And this is a book about honesty. Most of you have not read this history, even you smart Georgetown students. So this history requires us for, to do honesty. And I want to keep bringing it back to where we are now. This book is not really about just 1776 or 1619 or 1493. It's about 2024. It's about where we are right now and where we're going. So another, I think, a luminary quote from your book that I want you to say a bit more about is you write this. The contemporary white Christian nationalist movement flows directly from a cultural stream that has run through this continent since the first Europeans arrived five centuries ago. The photographs of the insurrectionists storming the US Capitol on January the 6th, 2021, bear an uncanny resemblance to the painting of Hernando de Soto marshaling Christian symbols to claim indigenous land for Spain on May 18th, 1541. A picture that still hangs in the rotunda of the US Capitol, that building. Seen in this light, Robbie says, the symbols brandished by the insurrectionists were not incidental. They were centuries old ritual implements of the doctrine of discovery summoned to do the work they have always done. So why and how is this doctrine of discovery important to understanding the coup on January 6th? Well, I am a big believer, being an old history major myself, that you really can't understand where we are unless you figure out where we've been. And this has been so central to the development of America, to the conflicts in American life, and to the deep divides that we are experiencing now. When people say we're more divided than ever, I never quite buy that. Um, we've been divided for a very long time. Some people may not have noticed, but we've been divided. Um, for since our inception. And I think what's critical to understand is that this is not a feature, certainly of one man, of one political party, but of an entire country that is built on myths. Every country has myths. Every country has its totems. Um, but that ours raised very troubling issues for a country that prides itself on being a democracy, for a country that prides itself on equal opportunity, for a country that deigns to lecture others um, in other countries about human rights. So I think once you begin to pierce this and go through this, I have the opposite reaction to, not surprising, um, to the MAGA folks, which is once I start learning about this, I can't learn enough about it. Because I will say in reading Robbie's books over the years, I thought I had a good college education. I went through public schools in California when the California schools were pretty good, graduated from UC Berkeley, graduated from law school. I'd never heard about mm -hmm. the Tulsa Race Massacre. I never heard about the Osage right. Indians. Right. Where did this come from? And you begin to realize that your own perspective, your own sense of history has been warped, constricted, shaded by this mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think that puts an obligation on all of us yeah. to accept and to understand our own knowledge limitations and to begin to figure out what the country is about in all its aspects. So Robbie, most of us, when we watched January 6th, uh, you're watching too, we're all watching. Most people probably didn't think of the doctrine of discovery. And you did, as you, even watching that. So tell us why that was so contemporary, the history you're telling us here, as Jennifer's saying. Well, 
I think what's so remarkable about uh, that day is that there were all these visible symbols and totems. I mean, they were yeah. out there, right, yeah. on proud display. And so you got to see exactly what the amalgamation was, right? So even if you only stay with the flags, forget the T-shirts and the sweatshirts and the patches, right, and uh, all of those other things, Bibles. Uh, but if you just stay with the flags, right, you kind of get the picture, right? There were Trump flags, there were Confederate flags, and there were Christian flags, yep. right? And that was basically the mix uh, on that day. And so, you know, if you know this history... And you kind of think, oh, well, like one of the key claims, right, um, from the beginning of the country is this idea, again, of America as a promised land exclusively for white European Christians. Like that's the that's the vision. And you remember the KKK, right? People, we think of the KKK as a kind of racist and it was just about race. But who else was the KKK not so happy with? Catholics and Jews, Right. Why is that? Because they were not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christians, right? Even the KKK is an ethno-religious movement. It's always been that, uh, that vision um, in the country. And we saw that kind of expression. And it's a claim, right? It's, it's literally staking the claim that, that um, we've all seen those photos, you know, whether it's Columbus or DeSoto, um, planting the flag, right, um, on the ground. And what's usually there, then maybe not always noticed, are two things, military implements, weapons of war, uh, and symbols of Christianity, um, right? So the flag, the symbol of the state, uh, usually there's, a, that, that painting of Hernando de Soto is remarkable. You should look it up. It's like an eight by 12 painting, uh, eight by 12 feet painting in the U.S. Capitol, uh, Rotunda, and it's, it's uh, de Soto, and he is riding in on his magnificent white horse. Uh, Native Americans are cowering um, in his presence. Um, there are cannon and all kinds of weaponry up at the front and, and, and the flag in the middle. And then on the bottom right hand side of the, of the, the painting um, is this giant crucifix being raised. Right. And so my reading uh, from a religious statement from uh, uh, from the scroll this basically that that was actually a not just a kind of they were, I, I sometimes thought maybe those are just maybe they're having a little worship service. Right. Uh, thanking God for the safe voyage or something like that. But it was a legal and religious claim, like it was a ritual of domination, right, that they were enacting. And we've got this still hanging as a symbol, as one of only four big paintings in the capital of the Rotunda today, right, as, as part of what it means to be an American. So, I mean, these claims are so deep. And, and this, um, I'll give you one more um, uh, quick thing. Uh, I was uh, stunned uh, to, to learn that when we asked at, at PRI, and our PRI team is here on the second row, thank you, all for coming. Um, uh, but uh, when, when we asked a survey question about whether or not, I wanted to see like, how, how is this Doctrine of Discovery 500 years old still with us uh, today? And how many Americans still believe this idea? So we asked a question that just said, do you agree or disagree uh, uh, that the United States was intended by God as a promised land for European Christians? So they could set an example for the rest of the world. 30% of Americans agree. Uh, with that statement, right? So that's, on the one hand, you can think for democracy, that's some good news that two thirds of Americans reject that premise, all right? Um, but on the other hand, if you look at the breaks, so who, where do you have majorities uh, who believe that statement? It's two main groups. Uh, one of them are white evangelical Protestants, kind of my people uh, from, from the South, Baptists and the like. Um, a majority of them affirm that statement and a majority of self-identified Republicans. Uh, uh, affirm that statement, right? And so, and, and again, today the Republican Party is about 70% white and Christian, right? In a country that's only 42% white and Christian, right? So you can just see these lines of party, race, religion aligning, right? Um, around this very, very old um, idea that is still very much with us today. To put a point on that, mm -hmm. I think, so you, you the future that the insurrectionist envisioned, right? It was one in which they were the patriots. They are the patriots. And they believe themselves to be acting in uh, the footsteps and the legacy of the patriots. And I think we've had a tendency to say, that's not true, this is not America. They are acting outside of the domain of, uh, of, of what is right and true and traditional. And I think, it is important to go and actually question that notion, which you've been doing. If you look back uh, at the Confederacy, right? The Confederates believed that they were acting 
as the patriots would have acted. And it's been a common uh, sort of refrain from the victor side that uh, they weren't, that they were uh, aberrations, that they were acting outside the norm. But you look at who the Confederates were, you look at who Robert E. Lee was, he was the actual grandson of a patriot. The, the planter class in Virginia, wore, they were the people who inherited both the land and the enslaved folks of the patriots. And so I think once you dig in, and once you start with this doctrine of discovery, when you start with the idea that you have a chosen people, it becomes a little bit more complicated as to who, well, who we are and who we are. And how, how that's still with us, as you point out, is a poll, uh, alarming poll that came out from Pew survey found that the majorities of white evangelicals, white Catholics, and white mainline Protestants, notice all white, said people seeing discrimination where it does not exist in this country is a bigger issue than seeing racism where it does exist. Bigger problem for them, a majority of white Christians, uh, crying wolf over allegedly false racism is a bigger problem than crying foul over actual racism. Well, it's because we did it. We, we beat right. racism. And many, and, and <laughs> African Americans, 90% disagree. Okay. So let's bring it right now to uh, yeah, Jennifer, please. Um, this is a constant theme. Um, it is, and it seems to be in conflict, and it is. On one hand, they claim white superiority. On the other hand, they are perpetual victims. Um, and they are victims because people are trying to take what is theirs, whether it's power, whether it's money, uh, whether it's um, the right to shape the country in their own vision. And it's important to understand that both for Christianity and for America, this idea is not peripheral. It is central. And the church has still not apologized for the doctrine of discovery. Robbie, to his credit, traces all the kind of mealy mouth um, half apologies and, you know, we're sorry if you were offended. And, um, you know, this really was a bad idea that some people, as if these were rogue, you know, priests and uh, bishops, were up to. This was the pope. This was central to who they were. And likewise, this is central to who America is. It is so easy to marginalize what we don't want to take responsibility for and to say, well, the country is basically good. Christianity is basically good. Yes, they made mistakes. Certain people made mistakes, or even worse, mistakes were made um, and passive. And that's this battle that we have going on. And it is a battle for honesty and recognition about who we are and what our obligations to one another are. Um, and people talk a good game about perfecting democracy. But if you don't wrestle with these issues, you're never going to get there. This is not simply a poverty issue. That too late in the, in the food chain. It's not simply an issue of rural America versus urban America. Again, that's the consequence of this central divide. So I think until we do a better job of educating ourselves and understanding ourselves, some of the magnificent incidents that Robbie traces, I hope we do get to them because it's not all depressing, in which <laughs> communities come together, white and black, Native American and European American, to address, resolve, to try to make um, a resolution that is just, is what it's all about. We do this for a purpose, to make this a more just society, to make this a more equal society, to live up to our obligations. And we keep trying to do that without wrestling with these central issues. We're going to fail. Yeah. Can I just pick up one, one quick point that, that Van made about, about patriots? Because I think one of the w ways that like reading this history and keeping in mind both the history of African Americans and the, and the history of indigenous people in this country is that even if you sort of take the, the, the patriots, right, the first generation patriots, well, what are they complaining about in the Declaration of Independence? 
right? Uh, so it's certainly taxation without representation that we still see driving around on license plates here in D.C. Uh, but it is also what were they taxing? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, there's that, and then but then there's also in the in in that document, right? They're complaining that that the British Crown is uh, fomenting uh, slave insurrections uh, against the colonists, uh, and uh, they're complaining about uh, the merciless savages, right? Uh, Native Americans, and that's, that's the words in the document, merciless savages, right? And, and the fact that the British crown will not let them cross uh, over uh, in, past the Allegheny Appalachian Mountains and colonize further into the continent because the crown was reserving those lands uh, for itself, right? So they were sort of wanting to do further colonization, push Native Americans further out, and part, that was part of the complaint, right? From, so this kind of settler colonialist mindset, again, this land is our land, right, uh, is, is there even alongside these very high and admirable democratic principles. It's all mixed up together. So, Van, your point, who are the patriots? You could all say, who are the Christians? Hmm. Because in the middle of slavery, these hush harbors arose from enslaved people to worship away from the white people. And out of that come the black churches. So who are the Christians becomes the issue. Is, is religion driving this, or is race driving religion? Uh, so in the phrase, why Christian, what word shapes the other here? Why a Christian? And so there's a theological question here, a deeply one, uh, from black history, which uh, raises who are the real Christians as well as who are the real patriots. Hmm, that's been... That's always been a, a really important question. It's sort of a chicken and egg problem, right? Mm -hmm. Is does the whiteness or the Christianity come first? And I think it's more productive to think about them as self-reinforcing and creating mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. systems. So I don't think we have a common conception of whiteness uh, that's the same as we do without the church. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have a sort of yeah. Western yeah. ideal of not just the church, but the sort of sinews of prosperity gospel yep, uh, right. in the right. same way if we don't have whiteness. So I view the black liberation theology tradition mm -hmm. as a similarly intertwined reaction to both of those. So you see stealing away in those fields, you have not just the creation of black churches, but a distinct theology right. that right. takes the idea right. of biblical freedom and salvation literally on earth. Right. And that becomes the underpinnings of the entire civil rights movement. That's and right. I don't just mean 20 years in the mid 20th century, mm -hmm. I mean the long the civil thing. rights movement that mm -hmm. began with the first enslaved insurrections right. and continues today. So, study that point. <laughs> What's going on with theology here, as well as politics? So let's get to the point about in the field. You went out to the field in three places, and you know, listening to our conversation, many could feel we are so entrenched, our American life, uh, in such white supremacy and expectation that there really isn't much hope. It can't be purged or repented from or just feeling guilty, which in Judaism, Islam, Christianity, repentance doesn't mean feeling guilty. It means turning around and going in a whole different direction. But believing that's possible is always a struggle that we all have. So tell us about how you went out and saw people doing some things and how you found some glimmers of hope out there in the field. Sure, yeah, well, in the book, I. I go to three different places. I wanted a, some different lenses uh, on it. So I go uh, to the Mississippi Delta uh, uh, in my home state of Mississippi uh, around people who are trying to commemorate and memorialize the story of Emmett Till uh, there. Uh, in uh, Oklahoma, uh, uh, really interviewed for people who were instrumental in telling the story of the Tulsa Race Massacre at its 100th um, uh, anniversary in, in 2021. Uh, and then in a much lesser known story up in Duluth, Minnesota, because I didn't want to just pick on the South um, or, uh, you know, Oklahoma being one of the reddest states, uh, uh, politically speaking, every county uh, voting for Trump uh, in, the, in the last election. Uh, but, but go to Minnesota, right? A good northern state um, uh, and very white uh, state. 
uh, in the country. And in, and in Duluth, uh, there were people working to tell the truth about uh, a horrific lynching that happened in 1920 uh, in Duluth, where three African-American circus workers who were in town for a single day uh, were falsely accused of sexually assaulting a, a white woman um, and were jailed uh, and then lynched by a crowd of 10,000 people hmm. uh, in Minnesota Nice, Duluth. Um, uh, they had, at the time, that was one-tenth of the population of the town uh, that turned out uh, for, for, this, uh, or for this lynching. And, and then people just squashed it, right? It was not told. And what's notable, I think, to me in terms of like this moment we're in is that all of these uh, stories really are only, uh, there's only been a turning point in the last 30 years, right? It's, it's, it's still in our history very recent that these stories are being told. If you had gone to Mississippi Delta in 2000 and driven through Tallahatchie County, uh, there was virtually nothing there telling the story of Emmett Till. No markers, no historical signs, uh, no memorials, um, anything like that. And a group of local citizens, uh, you know, came together and said, you know, we've got to tell the truth. If we want a better future for our kids, we've got to tell a better story about what happened. And it was a group of, it's a very rural, very poor uh, county, and it was a group of descendants of enslavers and descendants of the enslaved right, coming together, uh, and these are, like, again, the, the county seat town has like 600 people in it, like this is not a big place, right, these people know each other, and they know each other's family's histories, right, and yet they came together and said, we're going to do something different, and it took them a couple of decades, right, of, of doing this work and building it up, uh, uh, but in that case, uh, it has culminated, and just, uh, this is not in the book, because it just happened three weeks ago, uh, that President Biden, uh, and actually ran in a van at the reception uh, at the sure Department did. of Interior, um, President Biden declared a new national monument um, uh, dedicated to Emmett Till and his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, that'll be jointly located in Chicago and in Tallahatchie County. But without these people coming together with no money, no resources, and just saying, we are going to tell the truth um, about this because we can't uh, get to a better future without doing that, um, that happened. Very similar thing happened in, in Duluth. Um, uh, one just remarkable detail there. Um, that uh, this, this, uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, a Latina woman, a white woman, and an African-American man that just got together and said, we're going to tell the story. We've, we've squashed it. We've never told the story. Um, and they did this in 2003. It was one of the first communities ever to put up a memorial to the victims of lynching uh, in, in Duluth. It's a beautiful plaza, still there t today. And it was there. What a difference this makes. Um, I'll, I'll just end with this story. Um, is that that plaza was built in 2003, um, that means it was there during the eruption of the Black Lives Matter uh, mm -hmm. protests, right? After George Floyd is, is, is killed just down the road in Minneapolis. Um, so there's this eruption there. Uh, but in Duluth, there's a place to go, right? right? For, for truth telling. Like people know this is where Martin Luther King marches start off from. And so people just instinctively, peacefully mm -hmm. came to this place uh, together and they were talking and marching. And, and the police chief... Um, who uh, was related to the woman who falsely accused these men uh, in 1920 uh, of sexually assaulting her. And he only found out that story because of the memorialization effort. He didn't even know this story about his family, but he's a police chief during the Black Lives Matter protests. But because he's been through this process, he, pol he instructs the police to police differently, right? To not over-police uh, uh, to be aggressive, but to kind of give people space, keep them safe, but to give them space. So just in that little story, right, there's a, a different way that things flow and happen uh, in that community because of really the actions of three people initially kind of getting together and telling the story. Robbie, one of the questions I had reading the book was whether you can size this up or whether it has to be done in a local community where people know each other, where the press and the political parties don't put a bright light on it. Did you form any conclusions about that? Um, well, you know, you and I talked about this a little bit in uh, uh, our interview that we did at the Washington Post. Um, but I, it, what, at least from the, the ones that I studied, what it seemed to be, what the formula seemed to be, local citizens coming together and saying, we're just going to tell the truth, right, about this, because we're convinced uh, that we can't build a foundation on anything, on lies, right? That we have to be honest about our, our, our troubled past. Uh, but then it, there are roles, though, for 
local government to play, like Jerome Little in Tallahatchie County, um, one of the first African-American men elected, by the way, after the Voting Rights Act, and when uh, uh, African-Americans were finally registered in mass uh, in, in Tallahatchie County, um, was a, a key leader. And, and to kind of tell you the amnesia here, so he grew up in this community, in the Delta. When does he find out about Emmett Till? When he's in the military in France, right? And he learns the story. He's like, wait, that's, that's right down the road from where I, I grew up. And he comes back and says, okay, we are going to tell this story, right? And, and then he becomes county commissioner, right? So then the county ends up doing some, uh, some things. Uh, the, the, the Mississippi uh, has this uh, actually quite wonderful uh, civil rights museum in Jackson. And it now has a big uh, display on Emmett Till, which it would not have had really, if it had not been for the efforts. So that's state money, right? County money, state money. And then I've just told the story of uh, the new National Park Service is federal. So I think there's a, it's a kind of partnership, right? But what tends to get it off the ground, at least in the models I've seen, are local citizens. And, and these actually weren't activists. These were just like people who decided like, nobody else is doing this and like, we need to do it and decided to kind of get together and, and try. To Jennifer's point, this is a media question too. One of the things that I'm most uh, worried about is how the country is living in parallel universes of information. Something in the Times or the Post, some people say, must be a lie, right? But people tend to listen to people they know and love. So how do we, how do we dig deeper into that? Sometimes news sources are just thrown, thrown away because of the polarization. Uh, so there was some hope you found of what ordinary, not even activist people decided to do because this is what was right, you said, for themselves and their children going forward. So where do you two find hope in all of this? I think the closer to home it is, the better the opportunity for building trust. Mm -hmm. um, you see this in all the polling. People will believe their county health commissioner, but not the head of the CDC. They'll believe, they think the local news, even though it's, you know, gore and, you know, uh, car crashes and so on, is more reliable than network news. Their family doctor is better than the medical profession in general. Um, on one hand, we should be concerned because we have had such an erosion of trust in these larger institutions. But it also goes, I think, to Robbie's point mm -hmm. that it is easier to build trust with people you know. Mm -hmm. And you are more willing to accept that people are operating without an agenda, but in a spirit of truth telling and reconciliation, if you know them. And I think um, it, if we don't have that, um, I think it is far too um, likely um, mm -hmm. that people will return to their political corners. People will return to their, you know, sort of um, red and blue lines. Imagine if, for example, nothing had been done in Mississippi um, with Emmett Till, and suddenly President Biden comes in and sticks mm -hmm. a statue there. I am sure white Republicans there would say, why is he picking on us? There were bad things that happened in the North as well. Why is he setting this up? But if there's a foundation of understanding and trust, then you can build on that. Van, what do you think? When I think about this question, the first thing I always want to do is to sort of question my own priors, to sort of think about them. because. I think the first question should always be, why should consumer X trust publication Y, right? Mm -hmm. And that's always a tough question yeah. to answer because I think in a lot of cases, the people who we are talking about who are losing or who have never had trust are people who don't think, for good reason, that said publication knows they exist or sees them. So if you are a media consumer who is reading a paper where you're pretty certain nobody there has, I don't know, changed a radiator out or flushed a radiator, why would you trust that magazine or outlet if you regularly change or flush your radiator? <laughs> Conversely, if you are certain that 
a publication has never hired or even considered uh, the real hired from uh, the pool of HBCUs or has never considered the role of HBCUs in society. Why would you, as an HBCU gradu graduate, think about subscribing to and believing the reality that this paper is putting out? So I think there's some real soul searching. I don't, I don't want to say that publications are totally in the clear and we just have to build trust on the ground. I think media as an apparatus, as a collection of institutions, has to do some real soul searching as yeah. to what its function is, right. who it serves, and whether it serves people or power. That's such an important point. Media soul searching in the middle of all this. We're going to open it up for questions in a moment. Think of questions that you want to ask from what you heard. And while you're thinking about that, we're going to have mics, but I want Robbie to end with just a quick uh, maybe thought or benediction here. You end this book called, with a second called Conf Confession and Call, Conf which resonates with our histories and our people. Confession and Call. While you're thinking of questions to ask, what do you mean by, why did you end your book with confession yeah. and call? Well, I should have known you were going to ask me to give a benediction, <laughs> right, um, with the word reverend in front of your name. Um, I'm not quite sure this will be a benediction, but, um, you know, I, 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 a couple of thoughts I've had, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll go to the book of Genesis, uh, right, um, here. Uh, in the beginning, right, uh, our myths, you mentioned myths, our myths start, right, and they try to take us all the way back right, to before there is anything else, right? So we're starting uh, with some clean slate kind of thing. And in the beginning was this. And they tend to end, as Genesis does, with, and it was good, right? Um, but what we see as good depends on when our in the beginnings start and what that looks like, right? So I think that part of, you know, what I've hoped to do with this book is to change are in the beginnings uh, you know, piece and, and to build on the work. Um, uh, of this, I think the 1619 Project did a, a Herculean a heroic effort at breaking us out of thinking about American history uh, you know, that uh, is like on that postage stamp of these white guys in a room. They're all posts. So you can see all of them uh, with their quill pens uh, signing the Declaration of Independence, right? Um, and kind of widening the aperture, right? And I think part of what I'm hoping to do is to sort of say a yes and uh, to that and to widen it even further, right? So that we see not only uh, the stories of African Americans, but the stories of the uh, original inhabitants um, of this land. And at, at the end of the day, I'll, I'll, I'll end with um, uh, something personal and, and James Baldwin. Um, uh, so a quote that has uh, stayed with me from Baldwin that I think is really, uh, urge me on um, when it's been hard uh, is he was asked about um, the way that African-Americans see white people. And his response was um, that they have an intimate knowledge of white people and the conclusion that they have come to, uh, and these are his words, is that they see white people as the slightly mad victims of their own brainwashing. And that really has stuck with me. Right. Um, and because I think if there's anything I'm angry about, about my own education, uh, both in my church and in my school uh, uh, and, you know, and uh, public school, uh, religious school, uh, it, it has been that I've been lied to. Right. Um, at the end of the day. And there's a, a, a kind of brainwashing uh, that has happened. And the way that story usually went was a kind of in the beginning was us and we are good. Right. Uh, that's how the story goes. We're the heroes. Uh, we're the and all these like language about we're the pioneers. Right. Um, you know, these, these kind of literally whitewash words um, that hide the violence, um, I, I think. Uh, so I think there's a benediction. I'm, what I'm hoping is that um, the goal is not to feel bad. Right. Um, and, and sometimes certainly uh, we do. But um, if we're thinking about this through a Christian frame, I'll speak there at, at, at the end. Um, you know, the first step to repentance is confession, right? And confession is not a comfortable thing, right? And in my tradition, kind of the Baptist tradition and the kind of whole revivalist tradition, we said this thing called the mourner's bench, right? And people would be called down to the front when they were under conviction, right? The Holy Spirit right, was convicting them. 
and people would wail. Like they would be down there crying and wailing, sometimes even rolling on the ground with grief, right? But that's not where it ended, right? That was them coming to terms with this history, what they had done. Uh, but I think what's on the other side of it that I think many white people, I think, and white Christians in particular, have barely begun to wrap their heads around is liberation, right, from this lie. Uh, and, you know, we have the scripture, you'll know the truth and truth will make you free, but we think of it as a kind of platitude. Um, but it's actually something real uh, there. I think if we'll just kind of latch onto it and get through, I think, the difficult part and hold the gaze in the mirror just long enough uh, so that we see not only, okay, the past, but we see a better way uh, forward. He, he can also preach. <laughs> <laughs> he can also preach. Thanks. Okay, we have a couple of microphones. Where are the microphones? Gotcha. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Stephen has the microphone. Um, who, wants, who wants to start? I'm, I'm always looking for students first to start. <laughs> I, see, I see some students out there I know who's got okay. Mike's coming. Hi. Um, OK, I'm also a history major and a junior. Barely. Um, but my question is about, like, you guys talk about confession and how that's an uncomfortable thing, but also about how communities can come together and tell the truth about themselves, right? But the problem that I find, like, as a black person, especially here at Georgetown, is that a lot of my white peers do know the truth and have access to that kind of information. And they go home at Thanksgiving and they go home at Christmas and they choose not to tell the truth actively mm -hmm. because it disrupts the comfort of their own relationships. Mm -hmm. So like, I, my question is less so for me and more for you know, um, the white people. Um, what advice do you guys have for telling the truth in your own communities? Yeah, I think that's a... a <laughs> That's a great point. And I think the examples we've been talking about have mostly been about uh, in places where folks were largely, even if not entirely, amenable to having these conversations. And that's places where they aren't. Um, I grew up in a town uh, underneath a Confederate statue and people are still very much uh, interested in keeping that statue around. And so the, the level of conversation that you can have is a bit different. The level of honesty that you can have uh, is a bit different. And I think that's kind of the default for a lot of people. It's, I don't know if we're at the level of confession yet, because I think we have yet to get to sort of the acknowledgement that there is a problem in lots of places. Um, and that's not just conservative places like where I grew up, but that's lots of bastions of liberal thought, like yeah. universities. Yeah. Um, and so I did, I, I wanted to pose that question to you earlier is, uh, have you seen efforts in places where they have not had sort of a spontaneous reckoning? Um, have you seen efforts that have come, uh, that have gone aground? Yeah, um, I mean, well, I will say that, uh, I mean, you, you know this area too, but um, Tallahatchie County is not an area I would have put on the radar, <laughs> right, for this conversation to go mm -hmm. well. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very challenging uh, terrain uh, there. Um, you know, deep history of racial violence, oppression, um, and again, like, you know, your granddaddy and my granddaddy, like that kind of thing, right? It's very connected and very... Um, uh, clear. I, I think it's one of the reasons why I find some hope that, um, and, and that process almost went to ground a dozen times. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the other thing to say. This was not a linear, people walked out, people quit, uh, you know, they came back. Like, I mean, it was very touch and go, right, uh, throughout, uh, I think, the whole thing. Um, uh, even even on, the, on, on the point of issuing an apology, there was a huge fight on the Emmett Till Memorial Commission about whether they could use the word apology. Right? That was a huge fight. People walked out of the meeting over whether they could use the word apology when, the, when they were going to issue a statement to the Emmett Till family, uh, uh, taking some responsibility. So, I mean, that kind of thing 
I think, you know, gets us there. I did want, Jim, you've been asking a lot of questions. I'd love, I know you've got something to say on this question. I'd love to. Brittany bring Packnett, in. to your point, Brittany Packnett, a leader in Ferguson, uh, often says, uh, in terms of solidarity and allies and all the rest, she says, okay, if you want to get tear gas with me, that's okay. You're welcome to join us. But I want to know who you're going to talk to in your circles of people who don't want to hear this. That's what I want to hear. So Georgetown classes coming up to the date should have preparation for Thanksgiving conversations. Preparation for, th because if we don't do that, what we say boldly and proudly in our uh, you know, liberal left circles won't really matter much. Again, people will listen to, they have to listen to people whom they know and who, who they love. So that's a big obligation to tell the truth in our circles of influence and not just in places where this will be always applauded. So that's an excellent point. Thank you for ra ra raising it. Bigger challenge Bigger should challenge. be not just Thanksgiving, but the family group chat. Yeah, we know that's where all the stuff goes down. Yeah. <laughs> and and let me, let me add to that, uh, uh, board meetings, educational board meetings back home, county commissioner meetings, where decisions are being made about removing things from curriculums that make people feel uncomfortable. That's the language in the Florida law. If it makes people feel uncomfortable, we're going to ban it. So showing up for those meetings, those places where those decisions are being made is really, is really a crucial, not just come to Congress and say all this, but back home where decisions are being made as well as conversations are being had. So, and, uh, and yes, the please. Troubling trends, obviously, we've seen of late has been book banning, book removal, um, sort of micromanaging how a teacher yeah. teaches certain subjects. And I think we have a fundamental misunderstanding about what education is. Education is supposed to open your mind, not confirm what you think you already know. And we're all for parent involvement, but parents can exercise a very nefarious influence as well. The purpose of going to school, whether it's a university or it's kindergarten, is to learn things you don't already know. Um, there was a book a long time ago called The Closing of the American Mind um, in a very different context. That's what I fear right now. And that's what we see in fractured media. People don't want to read other media because it'll have inconvenient things said or facts they don't want to deal with. They don't want to have certain subjects taught because that would make people feel bad. Mm -hmm. right. um, and we have to really get past that. This is dangerously stultifying stuff. Another student with a question? Yes, right here in front. Hi, um, I'm a student at the McCourt School of Public Policy, mm -hmm. um, doing my master's. And I guess um, when I was listening to your conversation, I identified kind of two ways in which we deal with this very overarching problem, which is one that sometimes the government goes in and intervenes, removes statues, and that creates a huge public reckoning, right? And backlash. And then we have very successful cases where you have these three or four people that come together on their own and they try to create some kind of truth telling in their community. But that can take a very long time, right? So I guess my question is, is how do governments intervene and kind of create modes for reconciliation or justice in a way that doesn't kind of result in this backlash. Yeah. That's by a public That's policy what? student. <laughs> backlash, you know, I would point backlash. to Mitch Landrew, yeah, yeah. who mm -hmm. uh, was good, the mayor in example. New Orleans, who had to face this issue of Confederate statutes. And he did it in, 
you should go back and read his public comments. And he did it in a self-confessional way, in a way that was not accusatory, but tried to convey to a white audience what those things meant to a black child who would walk by them every day, what, they, what message that was being sent out. And I think you have to do it with empathy. I think you need empathetic leadership. Um, and he was able to do it at a city level. Um, less successful in, was in Richmond. Um, but even if it's difficult, I think the, the goal should not be to avoid conflict or backlash, as you say. It should be to wrestle through these problems so that you get out the other end. But I think the people who tend to do the, the best are the ones who do not start from a place of accusation, but a place of empathy. Imagine you were in this person's shoes. How does this look from your perspective? And I've thought for a long time we have an empathy um, deficit in this country that's far bigger than any federal deficit that we may have. And that's a very hard skill to master. And we should reward politicians who engage in it, even if it's rocky or even if it doesn't work. And I would Mitch, add the word proximity to empathy. Mitch Lander, mayor of New Orleans, kept on his desk a big folder. And in the folder, on one side of the page was a picture of a young black man like graduating from school, looking very powerful. And other side is his body on the streets of New Orleans. Massive homicide going on. Mitch kept that on his desk. And he had to keep, as a white man, he had to keep his proximity. So empathy has got to go along, I think, with proximity. You know, speak I was just going to say, he also drew in his Catholic faith. That's right. Um, he, he was very uh, overt about that and talked about his Jesuit education, right, and how that shaped, um, you know, how he thought about these issues. And I think in a way that resonated with other people who shared his background in New Orleans. And, and I think that was a big part of bridging. It still didn't prevent, uh, you know, still had to have massive security, uh, you know, multiple contractors refused to even take the jobs to remove the monuments. There was sugar poured into gas tanks. I mean, there was still that kind of thing that went on. But I think there was an effort to uh, communicate. And, and his speech that he gave uh, on the kind of eve of the removal is quite a piece of political um, uh, kind of accomplishment. It's, it's, uh, his book is called, um, uh, help me here, it's In the Shadow of Monuments, I think yeah. is the name mm -hmm. of his book. And it's, his speech is in the appendix of that. But you can also look it up on YouTube. It's, it's a really magnificent uh, you know, piece of kind of political and moral oratory. Um, Mitchell Andrews' speech, Removing the Monuments. Take a look at it. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's in the Atlantic. <laughs> okay. um, which, there you go. Which is right. the media we can all trust. Don't Google it, just go to the Atlantic. When Grant's running it. But I'm going to appeal to a. Go ahead. Speak. I'll also say for that, um, this was the question that Martin Luther King wrestled with in his final book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And he, you know, he talked about backlash before, but he really sort of started robustly theorizing what it meant that backlash seemed inevitable and what to do with that. Um, he was in the middle of quite a significant backlash near the end of his life. And I think where he was heading and where people uh, who were um, often seen as being opposed to him on the ground, black radicals, where they were heading, was trying to figure out maybe the question needed to be a different question. Maybe the question needed to be how did you make movements of people and movements of civics resilient mm -hmm. to that backlash. Mm -hmm. Not trying to figure out how to make a massive systemic change without conflict or friction, but how do you build things that are resistant to that friction? And I think that's, I don't know if I have a proper answer for you, but I do think that's the mm -hmm. best framing. Still the right question. Where do we go from here? Now, we don't have any Catholics on the stage to talk about papal bulls, but I see one in the audience. David, you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm Father David Hollenbach. I'm one of the Jesuits here at Georgetown. And I thank you very much for this very stimulating presentation. And I'd just like to raise a question for you. I haven't read your new book, which I'm going to read, but uh, about the history. 
And certainly the doctrine of discovery is a very major problem that still has major influence. I agree with that completely. But I'm wondering if in your book you get involved in some of the opponents to the doctrine of discovery that were writing back and participating in the debates that took place in the early 1500s. I'm thinking about people like Bartolome de las Casas, and Francisco Vitoria, they took a position very much opposed to the idea that the white men from Europe, because they were Christians, had the right to control. And Vitoria, uh, Las Casas and Vitoria are not the world's most famous names, but Vitoria is regarded as the father of international law. And in terms of the implications of that for a human rights doctrine, all I'm suggesting is maybe there's a complexity to the history that can enable us to draw upon some elements of history that can move us forward in a more positive direction. I'm not disagreeing with you on the problem that we face, but I'm just wondering whether you deal with some of those resources that might be available for addressing yeah. the problem. Now, thank you. Fan of your work, by the way. Thank you. Thank um, you. It, <laughs> um, uh, so I don't deal with them at, at length in the book. Um, I, you know, you're right that they're there. Um, you're right that they provide. I, I feel like they're like minority opinions and Supreme Court decisions. You know, that they provide <laughs> these kind of resources that we can go back to and we can and, and did go back to and draw this kind of other vein um, out there. Are the abolitionists right uh, that that uh, we have inside the Christian Church? Uh, you know that are. Uh, that are, that are still there. The, I think the challenge, uh, you know, for it is, is that it still persists, right? I think that, and that's the line I'm really trying to draw is that like, despite those voices, despite the abolitionists, despite, uh, you know, those, those uh, voices that, you know, ended up being kind of minority voices that stuck around and we can, the fact that you're still pronouncing their names here today, right, means that they're part of the historical record, they're part of the influence uh, and, and part of the things we can still go back to and use, I think, to build something different and, and have. So I think that that's a, a important. Jim and I were talking, I, I know Jim's one of uh, Jim's uh, favorite lines is, you know, the, the, uh, the answer to bad religion is, is good religion, or at least better religion, um, you know. Uh, yeah, um, and I think that, that that's right. There are those resources uh, there, and it's, it's important. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm holding the lens as closely as I can, because uh, I, I do think the temptation, and, and I'll just be confessional here, uh, the temptation is always to look away and to find the exception. Uh, and I think for white Christian people, I am trying to hold our feet to the fire as much as I can um, to kind of be responsible uh, uh, and not to not too quick. But the abolitionists, right, I think is one of our favorite, you know, moves, uh, you know, here. Um, and Wilberforce, you know, and like those kinds of things. But uh, but, and, and of course that's right, but I, but I also think that um, for this moment, we still need to hold the gaze. And, and that's really what I'm trying to hold up in the book. And, and while many abolitionists were, were of the Christian faith, Frederick Douglass, Southern Truth, there's a movement now called white Christian nationalism growing in the churches, mega, mega churches, that is not influenced by Southern Truth, by that kind of Christian faith, it's there. So I want our, our, our young people to discover those abolitionists. So instead of feeling uncomfortable as their parents are afraid they might, they say, I want to be an abolitionist too. I want to be one of them now. What does that mean? What does that look like? Time for a few more. I see a hand. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm also a student here. So. So often in media, we see that movements and efforts to create change are misrepresented. We see buzzwords such as terrorists or protests and all these kind of mm -hmm. good effort face that are to trying to change the system but are being misrepresented to the mass public and are being made um, not attractive per se. And so how do we go about confronting media and creating these positive interactions with the general public to make them seem more palatable? So, you have a with that? Yeah. I have a couple of thoughts. I bet you do. <laughs> um, I mean, I think... Uh, You've seen a couple of, you maybe have seen a couple of uh, representations of movements in Atlanta uh, where collective action and mutual aid are now being um, uh, weaponized against uh, people. Um, I think 
where I land on this is number one, you as an active consumer, you, your consumption choices do matter, but also you are an active creator of media as well. Um, and I think there is a tendency to view media solely as a broadcast phenomenon, something that we take in like plants, you know, photosynthesize. But media, especially today, is participatory. Not, I'm not talking about the comments and pieces, Lord, they're terrible. Um, but I think a lot of the most commonly sort of consumed uh, outlets for people are places where you, as a person who is reading and wants the media to do a thing, have some leverage. So there are local papers where you can uh, write letters. There are local papers where you can subscribe if you think they are um, a little bit closer to where you want them to be. There is your voice online and in social media. Uh, I think there are so many different ways that people who want to be who want to shape the media and who want to be ethical media consumers can actually be actively engaged in this. And obviously, I think, as I said before, there is a duty on behalf of the media outlets and organizations to be better and to think about their role in the world, to be better stewards of the public trust. Uh, but I think it, it ultimately as a person who is creating and also consuming media, uh, the power is in the, in the hands of the consumer, ultimately. And you'd be surprised how much writers care about what people think. <laughs> uh, we all like to say, particularly on the opinion side, I just you know, write what I think. Um, but if you write politely and you write not too long, readers will get through to writers. And almost every major newspaper, and some not major newspapers, have all kinds of reader forums these days, chats and Q&A sessions and um, you know, uh, whatever Twitter is called now, X spaces, um, so that you do have an opportunity to debate and to influence. And I do learn things from readers. And I do wonder at times whether I'm talking simply to the converted and whether I need to have a, a broader you know, listening uh, vein. So you can, and you, when you do that, you can influence not only the writer, but the other readers and the other participants as well. Media is much more interactive than it ever used to be. Um, my one complaint is that we still need public editors, um, which have gone out of fashion because they were traditionally the advocate for the public and knew enough about publications to critically assess whether mistakes um, and uh, omissions um, need to be corrected. Um, but you too can be the public editor and you should take advantage of those forms. So what I hear from Van and Jennifer is a good way maybe to end this thing. Uh, for students, don't ask what media should I consume, but what should I create? What should I help create? And if we're going to make that fundamental choice that Robbie lays out throughout this book about uh, a history that still enslaves us, enslaves white people, in the enslavement mentality. How, how, do, how do we really make that choice for a genuine multiracial democracy? And that means a whole new generation become media creators for that multiracial democracy. I'd like to give thanks to the PPRI crew who are here. Could you, could you all stand up? Yay. Come on. And then, thank you, our Center in Faith and Justice staff. Jim Simpson's back there. Stephen, where are you? <laughs> Kathleen, where are you? All right. They'll be happy to tell you more about the Center. Uh, thank you for coming. I know it was a hot walk. 
to get here, but you came. And there's about 700 of you online. Glad you joined us too. Let's give one more round of applause to our Robbie and Jennifer and Dan. Robbie is signing books, and there's food and even some drink back there, so help yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.